Welcome to Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. This is your guest co-host, Jennifer Milner, here with Dr. Linda Bluestein for another episode of this dance-specific series. Today, we have a very special treat in store for you as we are speaking with Australian physiotherapist, Lisa Howell. In addition to being a physiotherapist, Lisa is an author, speaker, and creator of the ballet blog, which has revolutionized how dancers think about their bodies, injuries, and performance enhancement. She works closely with some of Australia's top dance medicine specialists and has lectured through Europe, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Australasia on dance anatomy, injury prevention, recovery, and performance enhancement. She's also been a guest speaker at the IADAMS Conference, which is an international group of dance professionals aiming to enhance the health, well-being, training, and performance of dancers by cultivating educational, medical, and scientific excellence. Lisa is well respected both nationally and internationally for her work with young dancers, professional dancers, and dance teachers. So, hi Lisa, and welcome to Bendy Bodies. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> Can you start out just by telling us about your background? Well, I grew up in New Zealand, so a lot of people think I'm Australian, but I'm actually a Kiwi. Um, and I grew up in a very small town, dancing the whole way through my um, adolescence and things, but went straight to university um, to do physio and did my training in New Zealand. When After I graduated, I moved to Australia and thankfully fell right into a job um, with a dance physio. And before then, I never realized that dance physio was even a thing. It wasn't really at the time, definitely not in New Zealand, but had some amazing mentors very early on um, and learned a huge amount. But then I started seeing that a lot of the issues that we were seeing in clinic could have been prevented. So I wanted to kind of move on and do a lot more educational work out in the community to actually stop a lot of the issues that we were seeing. Um, started doing that in 2005 when I started my own clinic. And in the last 15 years, um, have just constantly been trying to get more education out into the community so that we can prevent a lot of the really common injuries that a lot of people think are just kind of path of the course um, because there is so much that can be prevented rather than dealing with it once it becomes a problem. Absolutely. I know that is a, a passion of yours is mm -hmm. trying to prevent them before they happen. Um, what made you interested in hypermobility specifically? Well, I'm hypermobile by myself and yes. I never understood it myself when I was dancing. I was actually very inflexible when I was young, which is a lot of people find surprising. They think if you're hypermobile, you're super bendy and super flexible. A lot of hypermobile people are inflexible until they learn how to stabilize or they may be inflexible in certain areas. So once I understood how much my own back pain, I had severe back pain from about 18 to 26, when I worked out how much my hypermobility was influencing it and mastered control, so now I'm great, touch wood, um, that's been a real driver to help teach people about the, the many, many factors that affect you when you're hypermobile and really practical ways of actually dealing with it rather than just accepting it as a diagnosis and suffering. There is so much that you can do, but it's purely from personal experience, myself not having that information and seeing so many clients come in who don't realize how their hypermobility is actually affecting the conditions that they're working with. Absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned that about you can be inflexible and still oh, yeah. be hypermobile. I couldn't touch I my toes as a kid. Right, right. And I will have so many dancers come to me and say, um, and I'll say, I think you're hypermobile. And they'll say, no, no, I can't touch my toes. And I'm like, your shoulders dislocate three mm -hmm. times a year. You know, mm -hmm. let's, let's dig deeper. So yeah. knowing that inflex, and this is something that Linda talks about as well, knowing that inflexibility can go hand in hand with hypermobility 100%, is yeah. so important to know when yes. you're working with hypermobile people. Yeah. Um, so you, you owned a physio clinic for several yes. years. Yes. Uh, you teach workshops across the world. You post yep. videos, you write books, you do blogs. You are so passionate <laughs> about working with dancers and educating them, especially pre-professionals and people with hypermobility. Yep. So how has your work as a physio and, and what you've seen during it um, shaped your approach and your focus on what you do? 
Yeah, I think the constant frustration that I had in seeing the same injuries over and over again, and often seeing injuries at really pivotal points. So being in Australia, there's not a great professional dance world. A lot of students have to go overseas to continue their training. And often just before they'd go overseas, something would come up that could have been intervened or could have been prevented six to 12 months before or constantly seeing the same issues over and over and over again in pre-point students, kids coming in for their pre-point assessment and being totally unprepared. And then they would feel devastated because we'd have to say no, whereas the training should have been happening two years before so that they're actually prepared at the right time. So it was this constant frustration in feeling like a stuck record of saying the same things over and over. That's originally what drove me to start condensing things into manageable programs that could be brought in at different stages during their career. Also, I remember having a conversation with my mom um, after a couple of years into running my practice. And she said, well, Lisa, even if you had existed when you were dancing, I wouldn't have been able to afford to take you to you. So a big driver for me has always been to make the information accessible and affordable because, you know, in Sydney, I have, there was a very high socioeconomic bracket. Everyone has private health cover. Physio is very um, widely used preventatively as well as responsibly. But as I've traveled, I've seen that so many different countries don't have a health system that actually supports preemptive training. So it's trying to get that preemptive training out of the clinic and into Pilates with Pilates instructors, um, high level dance teachers into the studio so that they don't have to wait till somebody gets injured and then spend a fortune trying to learn this after the fact. So it was really trying to make sure that what I see is so simple is not being done globally at all um, in many, many studios. So trying to get that out as much as possible. Nice. That, that makes a lot of sense. And in terms of the, um, the biggest recurring themes that you kind of covered a little bit, but could you go into just a little bit more depth in terms of what the big recurring themes are that you see in working with hypermobile dancers? Yeah. Um, Initially, so 20 years ago when I started practicing, um, we saw so many foot and ankle injuries. And that was by far the biggest thing that I saw. And which is why I did the perfect point book and the advanced foot control. And a lot of my early work was about foot control and things like that. What I noticed is that as the studios around us learned this work, started integrating it, we had far fewer issues in this area. But in the last, especially five to 10 years with the rise of social media, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, um, we're seeing a huge amount more hip injuries and back injuries, and especially Mm -hmm. in the hypermobile kids. There is this idolization of extreme mobility. And my real concern is that some of these students who often have an undiagnosed type of mobility disorder of some kind are being used as the little show ponies and the advertising for studios. The kids don't feel it yet. So everyone thinks it's okay, including their parents and including some of the teachers, but seeing those kids long-term, but also seeing the kids who aren't hypermobile trying to copy the kids with excessive mobility and trying to push themselves into things in their bedrooms, in their lounge rooms, when they're falling around in the playground. This is really concerning me. So the more information that we can get about the differences in body types and what's appropriate at certain points of training, I think the better because we're seeing injuries in 12 year olds, 11 and 12 year olds, which we only used to see in professional classical dancers or contortionists um, in their 20s or late teens, early 20s. And trying to rehab an 11-year-old with a labral tear is really, Mm. really, really hard Mm. because they just don't have the body awareness or the the mastery of their body to do the detailed rehab that is required. Wow. Yeah. And and Mm. like you were alluding to, you wonder how is that person going to feel 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Yeah, and so forty the years work- from now, you know, you think right. about sixty. Right. If they're having their first arthroscopy and their first resurfacing at fourteen, mm-hmm. where are they going to be by the time they're forty-five? Mm-hmm. Right. So right. this is a massive concern, and from the surgeon's point of view, they don't have data on what happens in this age group because it's happened so quickly. A lot of them are doing procedures on that they would normally be doing on adults, on adolescents who haven't even gone through puberty yet. It's a very big difference. And so a lot of them are kind of 
we'll try this and see what goes, but there's no history of it. So right. I think it's a very serious issue. And a lot of people don't realize how dire it is if they're not seeing the, the long-term injury side of it. Right. Yeah. And we did an episode with um, Dr. Wells and he would, that he's a hip preservationist, Dr. Joel Wells, which mm-hmm. was really great because I totally agree with everything that you're saying. And surgeons, understandably, are going to be optimistic about the outcome of the of the surgery. And maybe it is going to be, you know, a great outcome. But yeah. what if it's not? And when they're that young, and even if they have a great outcome, mm-hmm. you know, what the long the long range? What um, if you've got you know, 10 to 15 like, years on each partial one? Right. You know, if you have your first right. at 45, then you've got a couple of revisions into your later years. If you're having your first at 13, you're running right. out of options for revision by the time you're 50. So, right. and hopefully the tech will be better by then, but it, it's not a great time to start broaching the hip capsule because once mm-hmm. you go in, it's never the same again afterwards. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And I think and that, also that is something that the kids seem to have this mentality. Oh, well, if something happens, I'll just have an operation and it will be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Which I think is a very scary attitude to have in preteens. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Very much. Sorry, so. Jen. No, no, <laughs> that's okay. okay. That's, that was what exactly what he was saying. He was saying, if you start to, to go into the hip and they're 13 and 14, where do you go from there? And it seems with this group of dancers, with this generation, um, like you said, it's happened so fast. We have, no, we have no data behind it to say, hey, here's what's going to happen in 10 years if your first hip replacement's when you're 15, yeah. right? Um, and so we don't have anything to help put the brakes on it yet in the studio level. I think that's starting to change. I want, I'm wondering if you're seeing that too, but I am seeing it start to slow down some um, in in dancer teachers at the at the the more regional level wanting to bring the dance science into the classrooms uh, as evidenced by the fact that people are coming to your workshops <laughs> i have a feeling that it's going like this okay yes. so <laughs> the good side is getting great <laughs> so that, and i always introduce my workshops i say look i am already preaching to the converted the teachers right. come to the workshops are the ones who are already trying to do it safely they're the ones who have already looked and studied anatomy they're trying to find ways of doing it better the ones who need it most are not there so it's a divergence i think that the the great teachers are getting greater and getting far more education behind them but unfortunately parents don't know to ask their dance teacher what their qualifications are and what their continued ed process is and i right. thought even in my own family i asked my brother whether his the dance teacher that my beautiful little niece was going to had any qualifications and he said oh i'm sure she does she's got a dance school i said you could own a dance school and he was, he was, I had never thought to ask if she has, it's her business. So surely she's qualified to do what she's saying she's doing. And I realized he's a scientist. His wife is an accountant and a lawyer. They wouldn't dream of doing something that they're not qualified to do yet because there is no restriction on opening a dance school, your local 17 year old can decide to start running classes with zero training. So I think this is something that we need to educate the parents on is how are you choosing the school that you are trusting that person with your child? Mm. How are you going through that process? Because they don't understand the risks and they don't understand that there are a lot of very unskilled people doing what is a highly, highly um, technical and extremely important role. So I think a lot of the education needs to be focused actually at the parents so they can just screen where they're even taking their kid because they'll often just take it to the closest one that fits in with the schedule that's easy without realizing the potential dangers. Absolutely. Or like you said, they, they may be looking, the, the child is looking on social media, like you said, and sees these people doing things that they think, oh, I want to be able to do that. And if I go to mm-hmm. that school then I will be able to do that. And yes. um, I, I agree with you. Educating the parents is critically important so that they know. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, do you have a go-to short list of concepts to tackle in most hypermobile dancers? Um, for example, proprioception, strength building, things like that. 
Yeah. Um, the first thing that I, it depends on the student. I treat human beings, not human bodies, is usually what I say. So it depends on what that person needs. One of the things that I actually focus on first is creating some taping techniques or offloading strategies to show that human what it's going to be like when they have some stability. So one example I had was an excessively hypermobile 14 year old. She came to see me, um, her dad's best friend um, had, I'd seen the girls in his family. He said, look, you must take her to see Lisa. She had been to a sports physician who told her she was excessively hypermobile. She was going to be in pain for the rest of her life and she shouldn't do any exercise. Oh, oh no. At this stage, I quelled myself, walked out, threw a tantrum, walked back into the room, said, <laughs> let's start again. Um, but basically she had been in pain for 18 months everywhere. She was having headaches, neck pain, shoulders were dislocating, knee pain, back pain, pelvic pain, and had recurrent stress fractures in her feet. And I thought, well, what is the best thing that I can do for you right now? And I actually use dynamic tape a lot. Um, and I dynamic taped her um, with about six different techniques to basically suspend her body. And she just looked at me and there's little tears pricked in her eyes. She said, I don't have any pain. I said, darling, that's what you're going to feel like when we can get you stable. And then she was crying. Her mom was crying. Everyone was crying. But she said, I, I thought I was going to be in pain forever because this, that's what the specialist told me. And I said, you need to feel what it's going to be like when you don't have it so that you can feel that this is achievable. The work is slow and laborious and boring. I'm telling you that now. But if you can experience what it's like when all of your superficial muscles are not working so damn hard, then you've got an insight into it. And I often use those taping strategies to help suspend them in the right position as we learn how to stabilize underneath. So the first thing I do is offloading and trying to reduce their pain levels. If they are in pain, they are not going to be able to find the deep stabilizers. Mm -hmm. Then we work to create first conscious, but then building towards subconscious stability in the joints. And stability is not strength. Um, we need to get appropriate timing. It's a, a very detailed process, um, but trying to create use the, the muscles that are closest to the joints to become basically dynamic ligaments because their ligaments aren't able to do that job. And then we kind of aim to look at the reasons driving their poor patterns and I find that by examining their day-to-day -day life we can often pull out certain things that they do during the day that are setting them back for me I worked out my worst position was actually brushing my teeth <laughs> and I'd hyperextend one knee lock into one hip and brush my teeth so by the having the taping on it also gives them a little bit more awareness of when they're coming out of their positions and bringing them back in but our ultimate aim is have them moving with control rather than bracing in one position. And I think this is where um, a lot of people attempt stability exercises, mm -hmm. but they're actually overtraining the already overused global muscles rather than finding deep, dynamic, subconscious control around the joints. The beautiful thing was within six weeks, she was pain-free. Oh. Yeah, she walked in, I I'm like, that. how are you going? And she's like, I have no pain. I was like, yes. <laughs> But, you know, and she had been given basically a life sentence from the sports mm -hmm. physician. So mm -hmm. the mum was just beside herself and she actually burst into tears. She's like, this is the first time I've seen my daughter, daughter smile in 18 months. Oh. But don't you find that when you tell them up front, this is going to be tedious and boring, just mm -hmm. so they know what to expect and they know <laughs> the parameters, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. do, you know, I, I have a lot of hypermobile clients and I do a lot of the tucks and tilts that you do. Mm -hmm. at the start of the sessions, just deep pelvic sta spinal stabilizers. Mm -hmm. And they will say, I feel nothing. And I say, good. <laughs> and, they'll, and they'll do it every day for two weeks. And I'll say, let's check back in on that. And they're like, oh, I, my back doesn't bother me anymore. Yeah. Uh, is there a correlation there? You know, and it takes them a while to see that the boring work equals sometimes nothing, no yeah. pain. And it's yes. the absence of something that says that it's actually working. 100%. And this is so something important. that it's hilarious in the workshops because it always comes up. A teacher going, oh, I'm not sure I'm doing it right. I'm not feeling anything. I said, if you are creating that movement and you're not feeling it, you're using the right thing. 
Right. And it's such a foreign concept for especially most dancers because we've been taught that we have to work hard. If you are generating the correct movement with no activity on the surface, then we're actually accessing some of those deeper layers. And mm -hmm. this is the, the mastery component. Um, you will get awareness of those eventually. But in the beginning, a lot of people feel like they're doing nothing. And mm -hmm. Again, understanding, I, I do a lot of explanation of the anatomy behind it, what they will and won't feel to try and normalize that. But it's often such a different style of training than they're used to. Yes. So there's less feedback when you've got a super floppy um, joint. If you're not at the end of it, you're not going to feel anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a really important thing for people to realize if you're not feeling it, it's probably a good sign. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And no pain, no gain, I think tends to be something that, you know, dancers are kind of used to pain, especially once they've gone on point and things like that. And so mm -hmm. I love the way that you approach that. And when I attended your workshop a couple of years ago, and I went through those exercises, it was eye opening to me, even as a, you know, old, mid adult, I was to realize that you could do things in different, using different muscles Mm -hmm. but the same motion. And so that was really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, good. And you've gone into dance studios all over the world. Mm -hmm. And what are one or two takeaways that you wish that every dance teacher knew about working with hypermobile dancers? Yeah, I think one of the biggest ones is how changeable we are. So watching fatigue levels on dancers is super, super important, especially when they're hypermobile. So you may find that one piece of curry or one exercise, if they're fresh in the morning, they're totally fine. If they are at the end of a long Saturday or a long competition day or a long season, they're not going to have that same performance. So often as we get tired, our endurance disappears so even something that at one point in the day they can do extremely well they may start to fail at so looking at fatigue levels of both training load time of day but also their nutritional profile their sleep patterns all of those other things their gut biome is hugely important to make sure that they're actually being able to sustain their energy because i find when they get tired is when they get sloppy when they get sloppy is when they start going into that risk of injury so mm -hmm. just because they can do it once doesn't mean they can do it all the time and watching their fatigue levels yeah the other one that I bring up and everyone is so surprised, but then they understand straight away is checking to see whether your dancers have any abdominal pain. This can be period pain. It can be any gastrointestinal discomfort, either acutely because they got food poisoning or whether they have any um, allergies or things like that, or whether they just have an appalling diet, which some do. If you have any abdominal pain or back pain, it will actually switch off the deep stabilizers that you need. So if they are just about to get their period and they've got really deep cramping or a lot of pain, those stabilizers are not going to kick in as much. It's not a good time to be trying to crank an arabesque or bust out six turns. And once the dancers understand this, they're a bit more gentle on themselves because if they can normally do six and suddenly they can't, they beat themselves up. But mm. hang on. If you're not actually in an appropriate stabilizing state, there is no way you're going to be able to bust out the turns that you normally do. So especially if we're going into any extension based um, positions, whether it's an arabesque, whether it's a layback in jazz, whether it's a pressage in a position in a contemporary piece, if they've currently got abdominal pain, their deep stabilizers are not going to be kicking in like they normally do and they're at a higher risk of injury. This is also super important for the physios to understand. I had um, a couple of male physios in one of the courses in, in Australia, and we went through the risk factors uh, for not having an optimal stabilizing core. We had one woman in the room who had 17 risk factors. We had one physio who had zero. And he had this amazing realization. He said, oh my goodness, I just thought people weren't doing the work. They weren't getting stronger or they'd keep getting set back. And I just assumed they weren't doing their exercises. I totally did not think of how set up is the system to even have that training. And the fact that a lot of women get scheduled to zero every single month 
Whereas a lot of males, if they are not hypermobile, they've never had any issues in their gut. They crawled well when they were young. They've had a very physically active lifestyle. They don't spend much time sitting. Their core is going to naturally spontaneously fire and any training they do will build on top of itself. A huge number of people have a dysfunctional system from very, very early on, and then it's being reset to zero or negatives every month. So we have to understand that some people are more at risk and the same training won't work the same for all people. Can you just elaborate slightly on when you're talking about each month going back to zero, just because there's going to be a whole range of people that are listening to this, and that's such a great point and really important concept. So would you mind just kind of, you know, I'm sure a lot of the physios are going to definitely know right away, but. um. Yeah. So if you have either cramping, discomfort or strong pain with your menstrual cycle, a lot of people have already associated it that their back gets sore at that time of the month. And it's not necessarily that there's something going wrong in your back, but often the pain in the abdomen will switch off All of the deep baby back stabilizers, often the pelvic floor is not as responsive. Um, You may even get some cramping. You may find that you get a stitch more often because the diaphragm is trying to stabilize. So if every month your deep stabilizers are getting wiped out, if you don't know how to specifically retrain them, and these are those very, very, very tiny, tiny little baby, baby exercises, we need to specifically attend to them to get them back online. If you don't know how to do that, or if you miss out doing that, then when you go back to your normal activities, you won't have the pre-stabilization of all these deep muscles that really help support your spine and the big muscles will tend to grip on. That's even for a normal person, let alone somebody who has super hypermobile back. At the more hypermobile you are, the more we need very detailed control of the deep baby Mm -hmm. back muscles to actually help create that stability through the spine. If somebody is very stiff and has really tight ligaments, they can sit unassisted without even thinking about it. Anyone who has any speck of hypermobility in their spine will usually hate sitting unsupported because it's a very conscious process to try and hold in position. And if you're not doing it exactly right, your big back muscles will get fatigued very quickly. So it is a big difference between people who have bound up tight ligaments and people who have sloppy ligaments in their spine. Does that explain it? Yes. 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 Thank you. That's very, (laughs) that's very, very helpful. Yeah, so the biggest thing is whenever that pain comes is going, yes, we need to deal with the pain, eh? Is there anything that we can do with that? I personally used to get ridiculous period pain and traditional Chinese medicine acupuncture resolved heaps of it. So Mm. is there something else that we can look at to help reduce the pain that you're having? But also every time you have that pain, we have to go back to the drawing board and reprogram things in order before we start doing your normal higher level stability work or dancing. Mm. That, that makes sense. Um, and, and speaking of working with dancers in the therapist setting, you know, we've talked about you um, reaching out to studios and working with them on that level, but mm-hmm. um, you've spent a long time working one-on-one with dancers yeah. um, in the years. therapy setting. <laughs> yes. <Yep. laughs> and they are all so grateful <laughs> to you for that. Um, but what are some of the unique challenges that face a therapist who is trying to work with a hypermobile dancer or um, what the challenges that might be facing a hypermobile dancer who's really just trying to get back into the studio? Yeah, Um, I think, yeah, that's a very two-sided question. I think I am now so appreciative for the amount of pain that I had and my hypermobility because Mm -hmm. it's taught me to be so much more sympathetic, empathetic, and patient when working with this. I see sometimes if there are therapists who are not hypermobile themselves, they really struggle to understand the complexity and the subtlety that is needed because they've never had to do that themselves. So I think there's that issue. Um, From the client side, I think that the hardest thing for them is that it is a very um, detailed and laborious process. Um, I've got better and better at doing it. So now I have a few more hacks. Um, So the way I get people out of pain now is about 10 times faster than how I got myself out 
which was very, very long, slow process because nobody was teaching me and I had to work it out for myself. And I've now got ways of making it a little bit more subconscious because also when you're dealing with very young students or people who are not aware of their body, um, it becomes much harder. So I think having the patience to go through the, the layers that are needed is super important. But one that I think is really interesting is that often people who are super hypermobile, they've kind of merged it with their identity as a dancer. And yes. all the people who dance with them go, oh yeah, they've got an amazing back. It's so flexy. And so often if we're trying to back them away from their extreme injurious positions, they have a bit of an identity crisis because it's almost like, well, who am I without my amazing back? And it's not that they're not going to have an amazing back long-term. I am not against extreme mobility. I am about doing it safely. Um, but often they really struggle. So they may be super attentive in the clinic and do everything right. And then you catch them on Instagram, cranking their leg up and whacking into a back bend. So they need to we need to spend a lot of time with them looking about the identity that they've created of themselves as a dancer and what they associate with their kind of superpowers or their their things that they're great at if you're trying to take away the thing that has always set them apart um, there's going to be a dissonance there so that's something that we have to approach um, and build back over time because if they have amazing range we want them to be able to use their amazing range but we don't want them hinging into it and getting recurrent stress fractures in their spine but it's something that i don't think a lot of people think about when they're trying or they're wondering why the the client won't um won't be patient or won't is not progressing it's often the stuff that they're doing outside they're trying to maintain their persona as a dancer and they're not wanting to give up that special thing that they've always had. And it's, and it is partly compartmentalizing, as you had mentioned earlier, you hyperextend when you're standing to brush your teeth, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And dancers will do everything perfectly for me and they will never lock their knee and they will mm -hmm. do their single leg work beautifully. And then their mom comes in to pick them up and I'll stand and talk with her. And 60 seconds later, I looked over and they're slumped and their legs are locked. Right. And <laughs> in certain settings, they have the correct posture, you yep. know, but they, they, they compartmentalize it. So when they're working with you, they're going to say, I have that lumbar stress fracture. I'm going to do all these things perfectly. And then they're going to leave and they're going to go, I've done my exercises. So now I can go do the things that my teacher wants me to do or that will keep me in the front row as I do the scorpion while everybody else does fancy stuff around me. Mm -hmm. So exactly. yes, helping them have it permeate their whole life and also see that um, that's not all that they are yes. is, is I think really important. hundred <laughs> percent. Yep. Well, so looking at, um, looking at the young hypermobile dancer, mm -hmm. um, your perfect point book, uh, I think should be required reading for every dance teacher and every dancer who wants to go on point. Yeah. I hand it out by the dozens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and every time I go in and, and speak to a different dance studio, I say, now get this book. All the teachers should be using this. Um, but hypermobility has its own issues, obviously, mm -hmm. with going on point. So do yeah. you have advice for the young hypermobile dancer who really wants that first pair of point shoes? Yeah. So the, 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 the stages that we go through, in the book. The first one is looking at range. Often they have no issues with the range. However, building the fine control is something and the, and the deep stability is something that they usually struggle with um, because also the, the makeup of their tissues and even their muscular structure, sometimes they actually don't have, um, they've got a different uh, range of muscle fibers available to be used than some of the others. So they will find the strengthening take a little bit longer. Um, so we need to be very, very patient and make sure that they are listening to the people who say you are not yet ready. Even if they think that they are ready, um, if your dance teacher and your therapist are saying not quite yet, please don't go and grab your friend's point shoes and try them <laughs> because <laughs> often that happens. And then once they do get cleared and they've done all the work and they get on point, the biggest thing is to not stop all of that deep conditioning. And the thing that comes up most for them is pain at the back of the ankle or a posterior impingement. So if they're sinking into their range, they'll often get a compression of the soft tissues at the back of the ankle. And then this does not get better by working into it. It won't get better by continuing to press into it. Some of them think, I'll oh, just stretch it 
by pressing into it more. If something's getting squashed and you squash it more, it gets more inflamed, takes up more space, will get more squashed. So the big one for them is watching out for pain at the back of the ankle and reporting it to their teacher and or their therapist as quickly as possible because if left unchecked, then it can become um, a bit of a problem long term. So I'd definitely be flagging that one to keep an eye on when they start and as they get older and are attempting more and more challenging things on point. Absolutely. And, and also for them to know that they should never stop their foot strengthening exercises yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and their ankle strengthening exercises. Mm -hmm. And they will evolve and get more complex. Absolutely. It's interesting because some of them do so well to actually get their sign off and then they just totally stop doing them. And right. You see them. right. And because I wouldn't see them every week, I'd see them six months later and they would have done nothing and they'd be back to before. I said, honey, you have to keep going with these so that you are continually reinforcing those good patterns. So it is very, very important that they continue with all of their little itty bitty baby foot stuff and are conditioning to the level that they need to support the dancing at the level they're doing. So the exercises that were fine when they were 11 are not going to be fine when they're 16 and dancing doubled the amount of hours each week. So we need to make sure that their conditioning program evolves as their training does. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what advice would you give to students and, and their parents who have been put on point? We know this, this happens sometimes. They're put on point, you know, at eight or something. And um, I know I've spoken with teachers who then the, then the student comes to their studio and they say, I'm sorry, but we are going to actually hold off. You're mm -hmm. too young. And, but of course the child, they, they want the point shoes usually and the parents, they don't necessarily know. So it kind of comes back to what we were talking about before, but do you have any specific suggestions when it comes to point work and parents and how to navigate that with their child? 100%. Um, with the perfect point system and my whole process of pre-point assessment, I say it's if you've got that situation, it's really good to get the parent in the room and go through the assessment so they can see where they are passing and failing. And them actually being in the room is super important. You can give them a report afterwards that parents don't read anything. Um, but having <laughs> them in the room and seeing them unable to do eight rises, mm -hmm. kind of important. Um, I do also have a very practical suggestion for if they are in point shoes and a teacher thinks this kid shouldn't be in them, but this is going to cause World War III if we um, take them off them, is in the My Beginner Point program, we have a preparatory exercises stage where they're in the shoes, but they're not on the shoes. So it's all about building stability. So there's a lot of standing flat balance exercises. They're doing seated rises. They're doing tondus in the shoe. So I've crafted a stage of exercises where if they are in shoes and they're not quite ready to be doing classwork, it will highlight their weaknesses and it'll help them build the required strength to actually do the classwork. So it's a nice kind of in-between stage because I've talked to many teachers who have this. They're like, this kid has been working so hard. I know she's not ready, but she's getting really depressed about it and the parents want us to put her up and I kind of want to keep her with this group. So this preparatory exercises stage is really handy because even when, they, when anyone gets their first shoes, they should go through it before they do their classwork. But it's a great way way to kind of halt them in they're still in their shoes mm. but they're actually being shown how unprepared they are for the next stage and it will help kind of stall them a little whilst you build the strength on all of them for them to be actually able to do classwork safely mm -hmm. and i think the assessment That's is fabulous. such is such an important um tool mm -hmm. because parents so much of ballet is subjective. Mm -hmm. You know, that girl is better than this girl. And it's so mm -hmm. hard to put your finger on why. But to give a parent a checklist mm -hmm. and say, if your child meets these, we can go on point. And if not, 100%. we can't. Yeah. They understand that. They can help explain that to the child. And everybody comes out of it a little bit happier. And then they have okay. measurable goals that they can try to reach. Yeah, 100%. that's fabulous. And especially if it's built in um, during the couple of years before it even. So it's harder when you inherit somebody from another studio. Right. 
Um, but if you have it within your own studio and you're building them up, it can start two years before. They know what the requirements are to hit before they go on point. So it's not that you like little Sophie better than you like little Charlotte. Or if you have guys who are wanting to go on to point, they have exactly the same requirements that they have to check off. Mm -hmm. So it's not playing favorites. And it's a really nice way of actually honing in on the elements that are needed. And it really helps support all of their other training as well. Um, but I think the focus is, and I'm actually planning to redo, refilm and reorganize the entire point training work um, because some, you know, we've revised it repeatedly over the last 15 years. But on talking with a lot of teachers um, and looking at how things are implemented in studios and also understanding the kids that I work with in Sydney are often very, very well trained. Um, they've got amazing teachers who are already integrating a lot of the work. I've seen in other areas that some of what I see as the most simple things just aren't even being done. So breaking it apart even a little bit more to allow it to be built into at least the year of training before they're even thinking of starting on point mm -hmm. in a very easy to access way. Um, and I think that's important for the parents to understand um, there was a studio in Melbourne and she's brilliant. She had had a one year program. She now has a two year program. She sends a PDF out to all of the parents, organizes a meeting for them to come in. They get a hard copy and a soft copy of her document, which explains the process that they are going to go through. If they're going to go on to point, the cost of point shoes, the requirement for extra training. This is what's involved. If you want to be a part of it, great. If you don't want this as part of your training, then let us know now. And she said her the compliance has been amazing and her kids were gorgeous because they've been working on it for two years before they even had their first official point assessment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important for the studio to be integrating it into their processes and building up communication with the parents so that they know why there's so much more work being done on this. And they, they have kind of a the big picture view because most parents haven't done it themselves. They can, oh, this you know little Sophie's friend goes to another school and they just put them up why is this even possible and the parents who really care about this to their kids will be absolutely delighted that you are jumping through hoops to make sure they are safe mm -hmm. however it still is absolutely gobsmacking to me that you will have some parents the therapist is saying this child is not strong enough for point. The teacher is saying you're not strong enough to point. And they remove the student and take them to another studio where they're allowed on point. Right. I see this as very dangerous parenting. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I will always stand by my guns. Um, and studio owners, unfortunately, if the parent is willing to put their child at risk in that way, if they've been given all the information, we also have to go, this is now not my problem. Um, if they are making that decision against the advice of two professionals to take them to somebody else who's not going to go through that process, you kind of have to let them go and wish them well. And it's something that the ones who care struggle so much with because they know the long-term effect of it and they know how dangerous mm -hmm. it can be. But mm -hmm. if that parent is going to make that decision for their child, um, we have to love them and let them go, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Right. Which is hard, but, but um, there's a point at which you can't be responsible. You've given the information and you do the best that you can and they'll accept it or they won't accept it. Yeah. And you will either be super grateful for it or right. push back. Yeah. Right. Right. I yeah. agree. And I think there's a very big di difference between the parents who have no information making that decision. If the information is not there, then that's one thing. If the information is there and they're choosing to ignore it, that is now that now that on right. Yeah. Yep. And yep. super hard. But <laughs> I've had to learn to do this. Yeah. To just let go. Yep. Well, and I've yeah. told dancers so many times that there's no one has regretted waiting to go on point, right? They may regret they didn't get to do this year's competition mm -hmm. on point as a 10 year old, but as a professional dancer, no one has regretted waiting a year to go on point. Yeah. Um, I had a friend who was a professional dancer. She danced with um, Hubbard Street. And so she was a jazz dancer. Mm -hmm. She got a, a part with a, a show that did point work. She went on point when she was 25. Amazing. And it took, her, it took her a week because mm -hmm. she already had solid technique and solid strength. And she was able to go on point and she would dance and she looked fantastic, you yeah. know. And the difference between putting a 13-year-old on point who's had that much time with great training and technique 
and putting a 10 year old on point can be quite significant. So, and they'll just progress faster once they go on point. And the thing I brought up, if I had kids who, you know, the kid who walks in and they just look like a principal dancer, (laughs) this one's actually going to go the distance. I would pull them aside and say, honey, I'm going to be even harder on you than I am on your friends. Yep. You want to be a principal dancer? Great. You've got all the goods for it. I'm going to keep you off six months longer than any one of your friends. Um, Say because you're going to be on point for the next 30 years. That kid next to you is going to be on point max two years. Yeah, they're going to stop by the time they're 14. However, you, my darling, are super talented. I do believe in you and I do think you can go the whole way. Six months now is probably going to add about 10 years to the rest of your career. Do you think that's a good trade-off? And when you explain it like that, the parents are like, thank you so much. <laughs> um, some, of them, some of them, not so much. But most of them go, wow, that's a, a totally different way of looking. I'm, I'm not going to put you up because you are so good. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make sure that you have every single thing ticked off. If I've got a recreational kid who is going to do it for a couple of years, I'm going to be a little bit looser on them. But if I have that kid who I think is going to be the next Sylvie Gem, I'm going to be way, 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 way harder on you because you are doing more training. You're going to be doing it for longer. And I want you to stop dancing because you are tired of it, bored of it artistically, rather than because you can't because your feet are destroyed. And I find once they realize that they're special in being kept back, it's a totally different ballgame. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. That's a fascinating way of looking at it. I love that. Mm. I say the more That's... talented, the, the more strict I'm going to be on them. Mm-hmm. Yes, for sure. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And it's hard because at that age, convincing them that we want to be looking at the long haul, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, we know that it's a particular challenge for you know, uh, kids that age for, for anything, whether it's, Mm -hmm. you know, learning to drive a car and, you know, playing any athletic sport or anything. But this is where parents need to be parents. Right. My mom was not my best friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But she was an amazing parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And I think some parents uh, blur the line a little bit too much. And if it's been laid out, I think parents need to take the responsibility to make the decisions before, until that child has the acumen to be able to predict long-term consequence, which usually doesn't happen until at least after 16. So we need to be able to make those decisions and guide them towards having involvement in the decisions themselves, yes. But at the end of the day, you actually need to parent. And if something Mm -hmm. is gonna be dangerous for your child, if they wanted to sit there and light their hand on fire, would you let them? If they decided that was a good idea. Would you let them? No, you wouldn't. So you actually need, we actually need to encourage parents. And sometimes I have to put it that blatantly. Say, actually, I know she wants to, but this is not what's best for her. Can you please stand up and be a parent and help me on this rather than trying to appease your child and be their best friend? Mm-hmm. And they, I usually have the kid out of the room when I have that conversation. <laughs> but, but it's important for them to hear it. And I don't actually think some of them have that said to them enough. Yes, that, <laughs> that is the most perfect lead in to our next topic. Mm-hmm. Um, as you're saying about lighting your hand on fire, I'm so excited that this is our next planned question um, about stretching. Mm-hmm. Because this is, you know, again, getting back to the whole social media thing and people doing the over splits and your book, mm-hmm. your book that uh, was then um, your dad did the illustrations. And yep. oh my gosh, that, that is such a fantastic book. Everyone should have that book. And you teach workshops also for teachers mm-hmm. and physios on flexibility. Mm-hmm. And I would love to hear what you think about stretching for, for everybody, whether they're hypermobile, hypomobile, um, a mix of both in different joints. But I feel like stretching is like the kind of hot topic these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my flexibility course is not about stretching. It's about understanding flexibility and the multitude of factors that come into it. I very, very rarely, I can't think of any time in the last probably five years where I've given somebody a static stretch. So it's about understanding where flexibility, flexibility comes from, why it's different in different people, the priority of restrictions that we're going through. So first, we have to respect bone on bone. If something is pressing bone on bone, yeah, I don't want to push into it. Um, looking at the importance of the breath, because if you are not breathing, 
then you won't actually have the appropriate mobility in your upper back, the relationship of your diaphragm and pelvic floor, deep stabilization of your deep core, and most restrictions and flexibility actually come because they're hiding an instability or they're being overused due to a, a something underneath not working quite so well. Mm -hmm. We then look at neural restrictions, fascial restrictions, and muscular restrictions. But I find I very, very, very rarely give a muscle stretch. If it is a muscular issue, we're often looking at retraining that muscle so it's not being overused all the time. But it's very, very little about stretching. So it is extremely appropriate for hypermobile people. And I think we need to be careful because some people say hypermobile people shouldn't stretch. You do need to understand your own body. And if you are doing an artistic art that requires mobility, you need to know how to be able to achieve what you want to be able to achieve safely. Not stretching will actually make you feel much worse. However, building the stability and learning how to manage any restrictions that do pop up and they may change that it may be neural one day fascial the next so you need to be able to read the differences between those and know super safe ways of modifying that feeling of resistance without overstretching your joints so i think it's essential for anyone who's hypermobile anyone who's not it's the same process but you're just not as much at risk of injury if you do it wrong so it's, I think it's very important for people to realize that flexibility is not about stretching. And this is where the magic happens because some people have been restricted for years. And even at this last workshop in Calgary, one of the ladies, and she was halfway down her shins when we started by the end of the day, palms flat, nose to her knees. And she said, I haven't been here Aww. in decades. Aww. No stretching, no pain. No, and she woke up the next day feeling totally fine. She came and she said, I thought I was going to be so sore this morning, but I'm totally fine. I said, yes, that's mm. because we did it with respect for your body rather than pushing it to do something that it is so scared to do. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding the way your body puts the brakes on is extremely important in managing flexibility long-term, but we definitely need to get away from the, the linking of flexibility and stretching. Well, and it's such a, it's so ingrained in, in the ballet world and in, in the larger dance world too, that mm -hmm. something gets tight, you stretch it. Mm -hmm. You know, I have dancers come in to me and they say, I worked a lot yesterday, so my calves are really tight. And they'll like start to get into the runner's stretch to release their calves. And I'll say, if your calves are tight, let's do some heel raises. <laughs> and they're like, no, no, they're tight. And I'm like, I know, let's work them through a full range of motion. And, and so training re-educating them on 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 it, just because something's tight you're not going to necessarily go into that full range stretch and stand there and hold mm -hmm. it that actually working that muscle through a full range of motion all the yeah. way down all the way up is going to be more effective um and once they see the results like you said that woman felt such a difference mm -hmm. but getting them to that point where they can see it and accept that and go yes what's next yeah that's the yeah. hard part yeah. yeah, but also looking at the multitude of different things. If they do have a fascial restriction, dealing with it as a muscular restriction isn't going to work. If they have a neural restriction and you're trying to stretch the muscle, it won't work. So the number of kids who you'll go to, into a, a roll down, into a forward bend, and they say, oh, yeah, my hamstrings are just tight. You ask them where it is and they indicate their calves. Like, honey, they're not your hamstrings. I'm like, oh, Oops. <laughs> so if it's a, a, a neural or fascial restriction, it won't respond with your traditional stretches. Mm -hmm. And those traditional stretches will often make it worse. So we really need to be screening. What is that restriction? How do we judge the difference between these types of restrictions? And what is the appropriate response when we feel it? They are amazing then at working themselves out mm -hmm. because they actually have the, the understanding to and the awareness to be able to unravel themselves no matter what they've done the day before. So whether they have been sitting, lounging around on the sofa on a Sunday um, or whether they've been sitting in a bus or whether they were at a competition and they've been doing some crazy things that they don't normally do, being able to assess their own body and go, what does my body need now? Mm -hmm. I think is one of the most Im important things we can give them as a dancer and as a human being, because whether or not they dance professionally, they're going to be a human and they're going to need that body. If they understand <laughs> how their body works, I think that is one of the most amazing things we can give them with. Absolutely. And um, when you were talking about um, 
stretching and being able to find what it feels like neuro, uh, neuromuscularly or fascially. Um, your other book that I hand out a lot is the Front Splits Fast book. Yeah. And I will, I, so many dancers will come to me and say, I want to get my splits. Like what stretches can I do? And I can say, you can buy this book and you have to do the things in this book and not look at it and go, there's no stretches and put it aside. <laughs> but, but, but when they work through those different release points, like you talked about, um, and just troubleshooting all the different things it could be, they release their thorax and all of a sudden they drop deeper into their splits. Mm -hmm. and, and seeing those things again makes them believers. Um, yes. And it's just, it's just changing the information that's handed, handed out and the expectations that they have as a younger yeah. population. Yep. Yeah. And if you think about it, the thing that's so exciting for me now is now the kids that I worked with 15 years ago are in their late twenties, early thirties, and some of them are starting dance schools and their knowledge is mm -hmm. massive. Mm -hmm. So one of them in particular, who I worked with a lot, she has a beautiful little dance school. Her students are immaculate. And they do half the training of some of the other schools. They have way better technique and that she is sculpting them so beautifully. And I mm. sat and watched one of her classes and I said, Em, my God, your kids are gorgeous. And she said, I just do everything that you taught me. And that for me is the most exciting thing is to see what happens the next generation when mm -hmm. we do have people who have been grown up with this. It's all they know is doing it well. That's going to be an amazing um, yep. generation to step into and yep. I, that's why I say I think either that we're diverging or the bell curve is getting bigger <laughs> the amazing <laughs> ones are getting more amazing and ones who don't look at things it's getting passed on with zero education it's getting worse mm -hmm. and worse and there's a lot in the middle so I'm trying to focus on the people who want to accelerate um, I you have to you can lead a horse to water. You can't make it drink. If you have mm -hmm. people who are wanting this information and passing on as much as humanly possible to this next generation, they are going to be the dance teachers, the Pilates instructors, the physios, the health professionals, the doctors, the, the architects of the next generation. So I think the more that they have experienced it themselves, they are going to be the ones to actually change the industry long-term. And their, and, their, and their bodies will feel better in adulthood than, than the people who have been exposed to the, the other end, as you yeah. said, I, I think that's, that's so true. And, mm -hmm. and what advice um, would you give to young pre-professional hypermobile dancers? Learn about your body. Um, it's one thing to learn about the human body. So studying anatomy is great, but you have to learn the nuances of yours. For instance, I had my appendix taken out when I was 16 um, the, the pain that I ended up getting on my back was due to one band directly in line with my appendix scar and two levels of multifidus in my back being totally wiped out after that surgery. Everything else around was working totally fine. But because I had hypermobile ligaments and I had this one band that wasn't firing, I had immense amounts of pain. What was needed for me was very different than what my sister needs, what my best friend needs. So learning the nuances of your own body, I think is the best thing. Working with somebody like Jennifer, where they can come in and explore their body long-term, finding someone who you can work with closely, who is going to be patient and work through at the pace that you need to unravel your own body. And I feel if at all possible, doing one-on-one -on -one or small group stuff is so important because yes. if a teacher is trying to deal with 25 people in a class, they cannot be that specific. I think we need to use the private lessons that people are having to look at re-educating their basic classical technique rather than just running their routine over and over again mm -hmm. um, and seeking out people who understand hypermobility whether or not they're hypermobile themselves um, there are some amazing clinicians who are not who are great at dealing with hypermobility but i find the ones who are hypermobile usually have a bit of an in-depth view on just how intricate it is but the biggest thing to keep in mind is if you have been in pain do not think you're going to be in pain forever. You just need to learn more because um, this is the most devastating thing for me to hear that people have been told, well, you're hypermobile, you're going to be in pain. That is not correct. 
Um, I am perfect living proof of it from having years of extreme chronic back pain to being totally fine. So I think we need to be very, very careful with the messages. But if you are a young dancer and you are hypermobile, it's harder. Um, you need to learn more, but you will get so much smarter, so much more intelligent as a dancer, Be have much longer career by understanding the nuances of your own body, the nuances between your right hip and your left hip. They may be totally different hips. So I think learning your own body inside out, upside down is the most empowering thing. Amen. Excellent. <laughs> and, <over. laughs> and that And that's true for dancers, non-dancers, everybody that 100%. work with the body that you have and not the body that somebody else has. And or the body that's in an anatomy book. Right. Different is a lot of people's anatomy than what is put on those little plates in an, in an anatomy book. It is when I was a student, we were doing anatomy, we'd often have different cadavers and different dissections. And I would make a point of going around and looking at the differences between them because they'd all had different histories. They'd all have different right. lives. They're all different heights and weights and races and nationalities and everything. And it was fascinating. The differences, even in their muscle attachment points, some were mm -hmm. vastly different to others. Right. We need to learn, we need to know that anatomy can be different. The bit in the book is kind of an approximation and a summation of kind of what it is, but it can be so different. So learning what works for you, is the most important thing rather than having one generic program that works for everyone. So any program I think must involve some assessment and training and reassessment to actually check that you're working on the right things. Sure. Sure. And for older hypermobile dancers who've been dancing for several years, what, what, what advice would you give them? Same deal. <laughs> Keep learning. Um, <laughs> just because it's been one way for the last 20 years doesn't mean it's going to be that way. And also don't let your ego get in the way of, no, no, I've reached this point of training. I must not go back. Going back to the drawing board is one of the most important things, I think, for everyone. And especially if you're one of those people who every month you get back to zero or if you have gut issues, they may be affecting things way more than you think. Um, so I think... Again, just learn your own body, seek out people who can help you learn your own body because doing it on your own, it is possible, but it's way slower and way more painful um, mm -hmm. than finding somebody who's been doing it for years and will have a, a 10 different techniques for facilitating each thing that you're missing and be very, very good at working out exactly what is missing. So hunting down somebody to work with um, and expecting yourself to continue to improve. Your body is in a constant state of reformation. Give it different instructions, you get a different result. And the thing that just warms my heart so much is the number of teachers after the level one training course who contact me three, six, nine months later going, oh my goodness, thank you so much. I am so much better because I've been doing these two simple little things and it's different things for everyone. But I've actually been doing these and I feel like I did 10 years ago or mm. I haven't had back pain and I've had back pain for 12 years so for me it's just that constant state of learning exploring more understanding as much as we humanly can and just being gentle on yourself not to achieve a certain level um, every day during the months be aware that it'll wax and wane very good very good and and in terms of um Switching gears just a little bit to future research. Um, mm -hmm. what, what kind of research do you, uh, there's obviously lots that we still yet um, would like to know, but is there any particular research that you're hoping to see happen in the next few years? Yeah, um, I think the great research that has been done and there's been a huge amount of work on diagnosing different connective tissue disorders, which I think is absolutely fabulous. Um, however, I think I would love to see more work on these practical strategies that we do. I find that there are a lot of very good clinicians in the world who are doing amazing things with retraining, but it's very hard to research that. So the problem is the way most research is structured is taking a big group of people, giving them a technique and expecting to see a positive response. Um, and I think the hardest part is that most good clinicians will look at the individual, go, what does this individual need? Structure their retraining around exactly what that person needs and adjust it real time if they're coping or not coping. Um, so I think it's very hard to do great research around this topic. Um, if you gave 
Jennifer, if five girls came into you and all extremely hypermobile, do you do the same thing with all of them? Not at all. It's so customized. And I brought this up at university. <laughs> we were looking at research and I was getting a little bit frustrated. And my tutor asked if there were any questions. And I said, so hang on. You're taking 200 people with chronic nonspecific low back pain. You're giving them the same program and you expect a positive response. And he said, well, yes. And I said, even if they are 36-year-old women, you could have one who's an Olympic athlete, one who's had six children, one who had Harrington rods put in when she was 12, one who is morbidly obese and one who is um, on the spectrum and cannot concentrate on the, the task at hand. How are you going to give them all the same program? Give me those five, six individuals and I will give you six better ones, but you cannot give them the same program. And he looked at me and said, Lisa, you're going to make a great clinician. Don't do research. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is the thing is that we need to learn how to research what the clinicians are doing. There is so much richness in what the clinicians are doing. But unfortunately, the research is often being done by people who are just coming out of their degree and they're doing their master's and they're studying something. They have no practical experience and they're not looking at the things that we know works. Um, so the, the, the research is not necessarily reflective of what experienced clinicians are doing in the studio um, or in the clinic. I also would love to see more research on the relationship between gut biome, diet, dietary support, and hypermobility and connective tissue disorders. I think there's a massive area that is about to be uncovered, hopefully. Um, I do think that's going to have a massive impact um, on how we perceive fascia. Um, also on the effect of our internal organs because most hypermobile people have their little lazy eye and they have occasional heart flutters and they have a sluggish digestive system and there's so many other things that happen when your connective tissue system is a bit insufficient, <laughs> not quite as fast <laughs> as it should be. Um, and the other side of that is going, okay, so we know that your fascia sucks. Um, it's not going <laughs> together very well. But looking at the research on the most optimal ways of training fascia for resilience mm. rather than unraveling. So I had a chat to Tom Myers. I went and did one of his courses. It was great. I had a chat to him and I said, look, so all of the course was on unsticking things. And I said, what are your strategies for training it when it's insufficient? And he just looked at me and went, Lisa, that's your area. And I went, put your luck, Mr. Fasher. <laughs> so, but he said, well, the clients that I deal with are all stiff as a board. He said, so all of my work, I've been working on unraveling them. Whereas those of us who work with dancers, we're often dealing with the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Sometimes, yes, they may need fascial unloading, but a huge amount of the time they actually need to be training their fascia to be more resilient. And this mm -hmm. is something that I haven't seen much research on. It's something that I think would be very, very powerful. And I think we need to focus the research on things that are going to change how people are treated um, rather than changing things that will sit in a textbook. Well, and that's, that's, <laughs> and that's really fabulous because, of course, now fascia is, we're understanding a lot more about it, but mm -hmm. it wasn't that long ago that we thought fascia was very unimportant. And now we know that fascia is so important when it comes to chronic pain. And mm -hmm. that's such a, a huge, huge area that um, 100%. is needing a lot of yes. work. So, so what, what is going to be next for you then, Lisa? Are you going to, where, where are you going to go with your work? Because wherever you go, I will go there with you. <laughs> Yay! Um, I think the, the coolest thing, I closed my clinic last year, July last year. Right. Um, and for me, that has now opened up a whole lot more potential. I have been hands-on people for 20 years. And I had always structured the clinic as a R and d facility. I had one hour, one-on-one, -on -one, or an hour and a half or two hours, um, one-on-one -on -one appointments and I used it to research as much as humanly possible about what mm. dancers needed. Now the focus is on getting that condensed into ways that people can understand. So something that I'm working on a lot is a series of injury management guides, which basically takes a lot of each common injury, say plantar fascia pain, posterior impingement, Osgood ladders, um, spinal stress fractures, and looks at what it, what it actually is why it usually happens 
and enough detail so that we can understand the nuances between it because it's never the same. There is no one program, but looking at how we need to assess somebody who has that thing going on and possible rollouts, taping strategies, offloading techniques and retraining mm -hmm. so that it doesn't happen again. Um, especially with the hypermobility, I have a YouTube um, playlist which is hypermobility hacks i do want to do a stack more on those and they are practical hacks that i have learned myself to get around not having great ligaments um, i am putting a huge amount of effort into the teacher training so running the teacher training workshops all around the world everywhere from norway to the us to asia to you name it Germany, say wherever. <laughs> um, but even more than that, from running those over the last five years, I've worked out it's one thing getting that information, it's another integrating it into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I've now filmed every element of that the original teacher training workshop. And awesome. I'm also creating class plans to help integrate that work at lots of different ages. So how wow. do you start to teach 10-year-olds about wow. their turnout? How is this different to how you approach a class of 16-year-olds? If you have a student who's rolled over on their ankle, how do you deal with this in class? Um, and so teaching people how to use the content in the exact situation that they're coming up with. You've got a bunch of eight-year-olds who are coming up with Sever's disease. What mm -hmm. things can we pull from the program that are completely appropriate for them? What information does the parent need? So really trying to unpack it and make it easy for teachers to use every day without them having to go and do a physio degree to understand it. So kind of digesting it, pre-digesting it down and packaging it up um, so that it's much easier to understand. So that's kind of my big push over the next Beautiful. 12 to 18 and months. That is going to revolutionize dance training. Absolutely. I think that is going to be such a huge help on such a widespread level. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yay! Um, <laughs> is there anything else that you wanted to say or add that we haven't covered? Um, no, I just, first of all, thanks for inviting me to be on here and thank you for the work that both of you are doing to raise the awareness of this because it is such a massive, massive issue globally. And I think the more of us who are out there um, educating and empowering and, and being in contact with different people, Linda, the work you're doing with health professionals to even expose them to the challenges that come when you're dealing with this. I think there's a huge number of medicos who do not understand hypermobility at all. So that's why we're, we're struggling with what some people are getting told when they go and see their health professional. So the work that you're doing to try and educate that sphere, I thank you so much for. Um, and I think, you know, we're all trying to do as much as we can to raise awareness to help people live um, better, whatever field they're in. So I just want to thank you guys for everything you do yeah. <laughs> well so where now i know where i can find all of you but for our for our listeners where can we read your blog and buy your books and sign up for your workshops where where yeah. can we find all of that so the balletblog.com is my main website and all of the workshops are on there. Thousands of free articles, um, the, the video courses for any of the paid programs. And we also have now the hard copies you can buy through Amazon. So you can order them and get them in a couple of days um, rather than us holding stock in Australia and having to send it across the world. Um, and then I have the, my YouTube channel. Um, and we're actually going through and trying to reorganize that at the moment and make it a whole lot easier to find absolutely everything, but just trying to get as much content out into the world. Um, we also have Facebook and Instagram. So whatever channel you like to operate on, we have one of those. I don't do Snapchat. Sorry, never got on that. <laughs> but <laughs> all the others, we're good. That's and okay. no TikTok just yet. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever our favorite social media is just look for the ballet blog the ballet blog at yep. social media and we'll find yep. you. but youtube it's actually there is a ballet blog channel but we're actually migrating it all to be under lisa howell um, managing okay. three youtube channels it's a little bit time consuming so all of the youtube stuff is going to be under lisa howell but everything else just look for the ballet blog um, Pinterest, we also have. So whatever platform nice. you like. Wow. Yeah. Just we've discovered so with the ballet blog. Yeah, it's we've discovered it's actually um, a huge amount of people were sharing things themselves. Mm -hmm. So we decided yeah. to make a core channel to make that easy for people to find the information that they're looking Super for. Super smart. That's really okay. fabulous. Well, we are so grateful for you being here. 
Um, you. you have been listening to Bendy Bodies with Hypermobility MD. Today, our guest has been Lisa Howell, physiotherapist. And that is it for today, but we have lots more great guests coming up, so stay tuned. And please go to bendybodies.org for links to all the episodes and to access the show notes. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like, share, and leave a review. Also, be sure to subscribe so that you can be notified of all new episodes. You will not want to miss an episode with another episode with Lisa or any of our other great guests. So be sure to do that. And feedback is always appreciated and can be emailed to hypermobilitymd at gmail.com. And Jennifer can be reached at jennifer at jennifer-milner.com. And this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not a substitute for medical advice. Please see your own medical team prior to making any changes to your health care. The Bendy Body's original music is by Andrew Savino and sound editing is by Rhett Gill. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time on Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD.